So yeah, this is a little talk uh, presenting the work we've done at uh, Utah Site OneWeb, which is a company that designs uh, and operates uh, cons satellite constellations. So it's not small constellations like GPS or Galileo, etc. It's like these sort of mega constellations like Starlink or like with hundreds of satellites. Um, the aim of this talk is to just present to you the, a general concept for a simulation tool we've built, because obviously we cannot really share like specifics or like actual data from simulations. Uh, but really to explain like what our approach was and also to create the talk that I would have wanted to see before I started developing this, which means that I would really like to get general, you know, just give general advice on like how we proceeded and how we attacked the problem of building a tool to simulate this in an industrial setting. So anyways, I st why, do I, why am I giving this talk? It's also to show these cool animations. Uh, thank you to our intern who built this, by the way. Um, this is a quick overview of what these kinds of systems are, are like. So you can see on this uh, on this slide that sorry, uh, you can see on this slide that we basically have a few satellites flying around, and these little hexagons lighting up and down are our users, depending on who they're served by. Uh, we change the color of the cell. Um, yeah, uh, the, all all these. Um, all this is to say that uh, we have this problem where we really would like to simulate all these uh, all these satellites interacting with each other, as well as all the components on the ground segment, and try to do this in a sort of relatively performant and efficient way that's kind of easy for people to use. Um, so before we get started, I will just give a quick overview of what our business is, what we do day to day, etc., just to give you guys a bit of context, and then I will start to cover uh, the technical details of the architecture of this tool. And finally, I will just give some general pointers on like what we found easy and what we didn't find easy in switching to Julia for this sort of development. Okay, so I work at the system engineering team at Utah Sat Group. Uh, and more specifically, I work in the OneWeb division, which is in charge of uh, lower four bits satellite internet constellations. A couple of pictures just to quickly give you a bit of context. We have our satellites from the very last launch we've, did, we've done last year. Uh, they're all integrated and folded up on the rocket, ready for launch. Uh, qu a quick uh, commemorative patch from our very first launch, which dates more or less the mission of the company when it was created, which is to bridge the digital divide. That means bringing internet connection where uh, to people that do not have it or where uh, like where, where it's not available. So you have to think about like if you if you live on a boat, if you like if you're a boat, if you're an airplane, or even if you are in some village that's too far away from the main internet backbone this was the application case for our system. Uh, it's also not just lower orbit satellites. You can put as many satellites as you want in orbit. It's not really going to help you if you don't have the ground infrastructure to follow up. So just to give a bit of illustration, uh, here's our antennas located either somewhere in Canada or somewhere above the Arctic Circle. These, these guys live on the ground, receive sen uh, signals from satellites, and relay them back to wherever the satellites want the data to go. Uh, finally, what does it mean to be a satellite constellation operator and integrator? It means that we have to do basically four things. Step one, we have to design our constellations, get them working, uh, try, to under try to get something that actually works on paper, and then find some contractors that will actually build the components for us. And that goes from the satellites, so we go see our bus and we might ask them to build them our satellite, something like this. Uh, or maybe we will ask some software consultancy to help us to build some software, or we might even build it ourselves. Uh, then once we have all the components set up, we would actually like try to design the management element of the system. So software that would help uh, all the components talk to each other and just general integration of making sure everything works. In theory, that's where we add value by like putting all these components together. Finally, we operate the system day to day. That's what it does mean to be an operator. So reacting to all the problems that can occur in the air or on the ground, optimizing, reacting to random geopolitical events or natural catastrophes where you suddenly need to give uh, service to a given area. That's like the operational system. And finally, we have to sell our service because it's not free to launch these things. Uh, you're talking about multiple billion euros just to get satellites in orbit. Uh, so that's a quite important engineering activity that we have to do. Why, why am I listing all this? Is because at all of these steps, we do have to rely quite a lot on simulation. So if we're changing something or if we're designing something, we have to have confidence that it works. And if we're even like selling or operating, we do not want uh, sudden changes or unexpected changes to uh, break promises we have made to pre 
previous customers. Uh, so this is how we end up arriving at we need to build these tools to really help us uh, just do our job. Like these simulators exist for this. Um, the final, this is the final intro slide. We're actually going to get into the, the work of what is uh, a satellite constellation now. Uh, in the team that I work for, the systems team, we have a sp sort of specialized modeling unit where our job is more or less to answer any question that can occur. And this is really the motivation. Like This is going to set the core requirements for this tool that we have built. Uh, people might come and say, OK, like what's going to happen tomorrow? Like What is going to be the performance tomorrow? Or they might say something a bit more complex. What's going to happen if we op open a new ground station antenna in this stadium today? Is it going to improve performance, make it worse? How do we integrate it, et cetera? So we really need to be able to quickly return analysis on this sort of uh, on these sort of problems. Uh, so one something we have found out is there's basically no way around uh, building a full end-to-end -end system simulator. So being able to load the entire system, having all the chunks available for us to to simulate, uh, and then just making a quick change, running the simulation again, and also, I mean, I will go into more detail about this just uh, just after this, but also a way to like simplify the simulations just to to simulate only what we need so that the result comes out quickly. Okay, so now I'll explain to you that we actually really want to build this tool. Uh, what are the difficulties that we are going to face and how should we architect this whole tool around it? Uh, step one, when you build this kind of system, there's 100,000 components. And like, when we say 100,000 components, it doesn't really mean uh, 100,000 variables. It means 100,000 full models of, for example, a terminal antenna or a satellite. Or something like this. Of course, there's like a lot of simplifying assumptions inside those models, but in the end, you need to orchestrate all these models together, just attach them, see if they work together, see if you're able to manage them in an efficient way, and then output your result. So okay, but like that's just a big thing. We could just throw a lot of compute power at it, uh, and it would probably be fine. Um, but the second problem is that, or maybe we could make like some sort of like simplified assumption, like grouping terminals together or something like that. The second problem we have is that we our system changes all the time, so we need to simulate at quite fine resolutions, and we cannot really make like sort of statistical as, uh, assumptions. Um, uh, just as an example, and that's something that people maybe don't realize about the systems is that your whole system configuration tends to change every ten seconds. So if I put an antenna out here today, your data path will be changing ev more or less every ten seconds, which is like quite often, but now you have to multiply this by the number of antennas you have on the ground when you're doing a simulation. Same story, you're changing satellite to 130 seconds, you might change ground antenna quite regularly, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, another core requirement we have is that sometimes we need to build really long simulations because regulatory agencies require us to demonstrate that over an entire year we're not putting too much radio noise in the atmosphere, et cetera. So sometimes like, the simulations are complex. They change all the time, and now we also have to build this whole a uh, really complicated uh, system. Uh, now we have to run them for a long time as well and also post-process all this data. The final problem we usually face with this, and that's actually what really drove us to develop a new tool because we had an existing tool previously, but we really wanted to develop this tool because we want to be able to integrate really, really fine-grained modeling to say something along the lines of, uh, if you have some sort of hardware failure in one satellite, you want to include this. Uh, without breaking the whole simulation. And our previous tools didn't really allow us to do this easily. Anyways, so I'm going to change direction for a quick second, and I'm just going to go over what is a sort of, uh, what is a sort of like satellite communication system, just to, to, uh, to, to give you an understanding of roughly what we are actually simulating. So there's basically four components. There's the, so from left to right, the user, uh, which is not really a component of the system, that's just our client. Uh, we have our communication antenna, the satellite, the ground antenna, and then some sort of point of presence, which is basically the, po the point where you're going to appear to the main internet. Um, simulating every single one of these components is really not that difficult. Like The satellite just follows orbital dynamics, and honestly, like this is not a problem where we care about exactly where it is. We, it's a problem where we care roughly where it is. Uh, the links themselves, it's not very complicated. Like it's just like there's a there's a whole theory of how you would simulate how much data goes for a link depending on the gains, etc. But that's not hard. The really difficult part about the systems is to get them all to work together, and it's all the management systems around it. Wh one thing we really care about in the simulation is to say, okay, like 
we don't want too many antennas to attach themselves to a satellite and then cause some resources to run out, for example, the power of the satellite to run out or something like this. Um, so here I'm just, uh, here this is a, an overview of what we actually tend to simulate in our current system. So this is a representation of a sort of transparent system. So the, we run the simulation only on the raw bytes that, uh, or only on the raw bits that uh, will go through the, the system. And we, it's just about the quantity of bits that we can go through. In the end, we, when you do like really high level system simulations, you don't actually really care which path the packet will actually take. You only really care about what the end outcome is going to be. Uh, so this, what you end up simulating is saying, okay, like uh, this, ant this antenna is linked to this thing. This thing is this satellite is linked to this other antenna. The whole the whole path takes roughly uh, gives you x amounts of bits per second, uh, and then the the connection between the antenna and the and the points of uh, interface with the main internet just takes some amount of latency that's determined by the network topology. Um, yeah, already this is like. This is not very detailed, but it's already quite a significant challenge to achieve this like at a scale big enough to have to derive insights of the whole system. Um, it can suddenly get mo more complicated, and this is a use case that we wanted to, uh, to address in our simulator: is to say, okay, like sometimes maybe you're going to have multiple satellites in a row, and you might put something along the lines. Uh, maybe like the satellite will suddenly start to read the packets, bring them up one layer, so the data will actually arrive. They will make some decision about where this data actually goes, and this is something we may not want to support in our initial tool right now, but we need to have the capability in our framework to be able to have this sort of simulation. Right. Um, so we finally get to it. Um, I, I, will, I think I'm going to take two seconds to drink a bit of water. Um, but so um, we have built this tool with the goal of replacing an old MATLAB tool. And I, I, I'd just like to take a couple seconds to go over the design of this old tool, um, demonstrate that there are other solutions to, to do this, uh, but we have decided not to follow them for a few, like just to get more flexibility. So the way we, we used to solve this before was to first of all solve the, prob solve the problem in layers. So first of all, solve where the satellite is going to be. This is just orbital mechanics. You're going to just save this for all times of the simulation, move to the next step where, where you're going to solve the spacecraft schedule from the scheduler of this general system, and then finally move to terminal state, which then will give you the user experience for our clients. The really big advantage of this is that you have access to all information about all times as long as it's been computed at the step before you're running, uh, as long as it's been computed at the step before you're running. So if you're calculating the terminal states, if you want to look at the if you want to look at the position of the satellite at the end of the simulation, you're going to be able to do that. Um, one big problem is that this costs uh, enormous amounts of performance. Like you have to store all this data, uh, and it's really not worth it as you make your simulations go bigger and bigger. Uh, so finally, our design goals were to say we would really like to build a tool that allows the three following things. Step one, we really want any systems to coexist. You want to put multiple kinds of constellations in the same simulation and have them interact. Uh, we, ha we have to support this. Finally, we want, obviously, to improve performance because when we were running this, we're basically buying the biggest uh, simulation machines that you can have on AWS, which is not a really cost-efficient way of running a simulation business. Uh, and finally, switching to Julia. In switching to Julia, we really aim to improve the modernity and general quality, so the general like confidence we have in the result that comes out of our code. Um, the simulation approach we chose to to go for is to say we are going to split the problem into two. We're going to allow people that write models to live their life by themselves and just write the models that they like. Uh, just in complete isolation, which is nice. It allows you to build your own model, test it by itself, and then just move on with your life. And on the other side, we want people that manage the general performance of the simulation and all the data flows uh, to be able to just do this on their own side without having to worry what the model is about. So in the end, we basically end up saying, if you're a model uh, writer, you are allowed to create entities just general entities that have some state, and you're also allowed to create ways to update these entities. This is sort of an entity component system, but simplified because there's no components available. 
uh, you might say, okay, I'm building a satellite, satellite model, satellite, what, what kind of state does a satellite have? So maybe it has a payload, has a battery level, and maybe it has a position. Uh, then we just, uh, you just tell us how to update these things and we give this to the core team that will find a way to do it. Uh, this works quite well in the end in terms of performance uh, because uh, Julia is able to just dispatch the right code that's already pre-compiled and everything. Uh, so you only have like a small compilation hit at the first step. You may have like a bit of dispatch that goes on, but in the end we find that it works quite well. Uh, we also, uh, and then to, to allow people who don't want to write models themselves but just want to interact with simulations, we also offer an additional interface that you can stop the simulation at every step, do whatever you want to it, and then keep and let it keep going with its uh, flow. Um, in the end, this simplified design uh, and ends up being visible, like this is how you, you use the simulation in our minds, in our idealized world of the first layer of the design. Just tell it when it starts, how long it lasts, how it will step, you will register a little entity, a Gen 1 satellite, which some in initial state of your choosing, and then you will just push it forwards, uh, interacting with it if you need to. Uh, in our full solution, we find that this doesn't really work quite well, because if you have to insert 100,000 entities every time you create a simulation, that's not really going to work. So we ended up building like a little bit of niceties around it, so a sort of simulation templating system, uh, as well as some sort of logging system to be able to save all the data. If, he, if we don't have these systems, you, we, we, you end up running into the problem that the simulation runs super fast, but you never have access to what happened in the past. You get only the final state of the si simulation, which is not very helpful. Uh, one special solution we also found for this is to allow to provide like standardized probing uh, the mechanisms which allow the users to just save some statistics about some variables as the simulation goes forward. Um, so in the end, this is our this is our final this is the final interface we provide to to our users. Uh, you, you'll notice that it has changed a little bit from the previous idealized slide, which was more or less what we, the idealized slide was more or less what we had on our spec when we started writing, and the final slide is what I did today to generate you this animation you saw in the morning uh, at the start of the presentation. Uh, one thing that I will, I will give is that uh, after you've just provided the start, end, and stop, uh, we provide straight away a sort of templating system that allows you to state where the satellite is going to be positioned. And it's, this one is called Walker Star because it's a standardized constellation configuration. Uh, but you're fr you, as a model writer, you're free to write any sort of templating system you like, and it will just go and instantiate your entities, and your simulation will just keep going. W we we ma we of course maintain like the uh, interface for just registering any random model at any point in the simulation, even midway for running, and then at the end you just run it, recover your results in your log file, and you get uh, the same kind of thing. Um, in the end, this plot is just exactly the same simulation I showed at the start, just focused on a different area. Um, but here, now that you have the context, you probably understand a bit better what is happening. We, we have saved all the state that we required for our logging system. Um, and you can see all the different entities flying through the simulation, some entities in charge of managing the resources of the others. And at the end, you get some sort of allocation, uh, some sort of like resource allocation visualization of your simulation. Um, while I have you see the down in front of me, I think I will just like put on the the, the full uh, system diagram of this. But this is when we transition into the main. Um, this is when we transition into the actual. Uh, how do we actually build this as a company, and how do we organize the code development process? So I've put like vertical line in the places where we separate our domains, but we basically start with three main domains. We have our library domain, which has, which includes the really good uh, libraries from the open source system that we more or less verify function correctly. Um, and also our own libraries, which include specialized geometry primitives that are really like super specialized to our own use case or some regulations, data, uh, radio frequency models, etc. cetera. Uh, in the middle of what I've shown you already in the grade, because you've seen it before, but some, uh, some place I would really like to talk about is this big vertical line in the middle. Um, the, the, the point of this line is to state that we, uh, we, we are actually going to split the development process into two. 
we allow we allow the whole orchestration framework plus like the core models of the system to exist in a place where everything is tested and the test environments are very uh, the development rules are very strict and other on the other side it's basically the playground where you do your analysis you write any random .jl script start up a simulation stop it in the middle write your models that don't work or that do work uh, import any dependency that you like, and this allows us to really split the development system. So five more minutes. Five more minutes? Okay. Um, and yeah, so we we allow people to we allow people to basically play around with the simulation, and it's really meant to be easy for people to use. That's why we have spent a lot of time developing the API as well as letting people play around on so on the site. That's how it works. Uh, this is a slide that was basically missing from every single presentation I've seen in uh, JuliaCon before, so I will just state our test pipeline. Uh, as an aerospace engineer, I cannot like I cannot have a meeting without talking about how we test things or something like this. I think it's required by the Aerospace Guild. Um, but one main problem that we have is that when you write modeling code, you quite a lot of your models just end up sleeping for a very very long time. Uh, you may you may design something, solve it completely, and then well, never use it again because design is finished. The problem is that you maybe somebody in two years is going to wake up and actually ask you to rerun this analysis. So we actually try to run quite a comprehensive test suite to make sure all our analysis is able to rerun at any point in time. Um, we obviously have our integration tests, regression tests, especially for external libraries to make sure that they don't uh, have any issues with like performing the job that we assigned to them. But then also like additional tools which are available for Julia, and I think that's one one thing that really helped us in this domain is that you can have a static ani analyzer, a linter that works, uh, and a really good doc system that uh, helps us out. Um, a final word about how we switch: you start with a team of eight people that only ever wrote MATLAB. Uh, how do you move uh, people to Julia? It's a completely different work environment. You definitely have, fiddle, have to fiddle with the knobs a little a, a little more. You know, like running Julia is not a day to day. Like it's not as easy as just opening your MATLAB environment and running it. Uh, you may have to, oh yeah, like revise doesn't work because you change the type and so you have to reload your thing. Like all this has to be taught at some point. In the end, we we start we started by providing quite a lot of testing, uh, quite a lot of training to developers, uh, really focusing on the extra features compared to MATLAB. So like how to package things, how to test things properly, how to contribute to docs, and making them contribute to docs as they're part of their training process. Uh, and finally, uh, once we give them an initial feature that's not too critical, so they have time to like iterate on it, work on it, and get feedback, uh, we can finally just let them lose on the code base and let them learn by doing. Um, a little word on uh, return on experience. Uh, what really worked for us switching to this language was we unlocked a lot of performance. Honestly, like it's not really a problem. I think we actually spend more time scheduling threads than actually running them, so it's quite. This, this is because we still have this uh, reflex of using really big machines. So we have like 64 core, but we really don't need them. Uh, the package ecosystem has worked great. It's really saved us a lot of time to be able to import an orbit propagator or whatever. Uh, our workflow has been fully modernized. Nowadays, all our tests run in CI, at every commit, everything is fine. It's not so easy to do this in MATLAB or any other proprietary environment. and. In our company, we obviously deploy a lot of cloud, infra uh, lots of things to cloud infrastructure. So far, it's been going great. So that was, that's definitely a positive point. The things that work less great is how do you actually organize a big project in Julia? That's not very clear. It's very hard to find. People say that you would like you should should like go and look at the Julia project itself because it's a great top example of how it should be organized. Maybe, but it's not very clear like how to how to build things. If you have suddenly like multiple packages in your monorepo, how do you build the docs? A bit difficult. Uh, you can get through them, you can figure it out, everything works. It's just a little bit of a pain point pushing through this uh, this hurdle. And obviously the debugging experience, I would say like it's the biggest shocker for anybody who comes out of MATLAB. The f it just, it, like, it's not that it doesn't work, but it's like pretty difficult to get anything out of the debugger in Julia right now. Uh, there we go. In summary, we have built this tool. It makes cool videos. Uh, we It also helps us to design constellations. We're able to size future constellations. We're able to run our current constellation. We're able to change all the algorithms that we want. Um, it's pretty easy to deploy. Uh, and in general, the team is quite happy to have switched to this language. Like Now new projects are happening organically in this language. If you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to take them. We have six minutes to take them.
Please talk. Anybody question? Thank you. And, uh, what a great talk. Uh, I want to ask you, how do you deal with logging? Uh, like, uh, yeah, how do you do it, and uh, what is uh, its performance cost, both in terms of uh, speed and allocations? Sorry, with floating? Uh, with logging, logging. How do you log oh. uh, the data from uh, the state? So the logging system has been designed so that uh, every so it's been designed so that in entities expose an API to say, okay, these are the things I would like to load. So the first step in the logging process is that we use all the available threads to go and find from all the entities what they want to log. We put we move all this in memory to a first log snapshot, which is then transferred to another thread for writing to disk. So we let the we let this whole snapshot live, uh, you know, like just in normal RAM. Write it, send it to a thread to write it out, and then resume our simulation in the meantime. So as long as it takes less time to write the snapshot to to disk than to run a single step of the simulation, we should be able to manage. In some cases, we are logging bottlenecked. It's true. So it's configurable. Like uh, you can choose what you want to log and what you don't want to log. Uh, so maybe something I can go back to. So right now we're still in the development process of the system. So that's why the logging system lives on the other side of the line. Uh, you basically have to explain, when you set up your simulation right now, you have to explain to the logging system which entities to go and have a look at. Uh, in the future, something I would really like to have is some sort of like uh, publisher subscriber system. Only one subscriber, the logging system. Uh, but you could set at the start of your simulation all the topics you want to log a little bit. If you've played around with drones or PX4, like it would work exactly in this way. Hi. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, I'm developer of the satellite box, so I'm glad it's being useful. If you have any <laughs> we are, we are glad to please, have it available. Right. If you have any suggestions, please let me know. But what I was really interested was on that visualization. How, how you create that? Do you have some kind of script available for us? Because it's it's very nice. It would be very helpful for for, for future futures. I would like to implement. So. Right now, we take our log file, which is some sort of uh, GLD2 uh, archive, uh, and straight up throw it into GeoMaki. So we, we had to like kind of convince GeoMaki to work for this. I don't know if you've played with this, but it's not always so easy. Uh, this package is great, by the way. Like I love it, but like there's like some small issues that we always have to iron out. Uh, in terms of releasing packages, it's something that I've asked about a couple of people uh, around at JuliaCon, just like what general process should be followed. Uh, when you work in a big corporate company and like things have to be signed off on by lawyers, etc. Uh, I don't know if we could release this out, but at least uh, releasing our fixes to GeoMaki, etc. could be interesting. Okay, thank you very much. One last question. One very quick one. I I understand that your run your simulation run basically runs on discrete time, right? Like the the steps are the Kind of discrete steps, like so at some point in one state, and then at the next step is a different step. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yes, okay. that's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just wanted to confirm. The speaker wants to come up already uh, to connect, and then we can do one more question as you get your lens open. So, one more question, maybe? All the way back. Um, in your uh, benchmarking pipeline, do you use any open source benchmarking tool or? Uh, we use uh, benchmark tools, the JL for benchmarking. Okay, nice. Thanks. Thank you.